Only three weeks before the election, Vice President of the United States, Mike Pence, joins me in an exclusive interview to talk about the Amy Coney Barrett hearings, what's at stake in 2020, the campaign, and much more. The Senate hearings were supposed to be about vetting a nominee, but did we learn anything new about Amy Coney Barrett? Notre Dame law professor Paulo Carosa is here with analysis. And relations are growing tense between communist China and the U.S. over planned American aid to Taiwan. Asian affairs expert Gordon Chang joins us with an update. Finally, the Vatican briefly opened the Pius XII archives earlier this year. Some scholars say they now have proof of Vatican misdeeds during World War II. Pius XII scholar Ron Rischlack will set the record straight. The world over begins right now. Now, Raymond Arroyo. A warm welcome to all of you joining us in the United States and the world over. A very special show for you this evening. Vice President Mike Pence, Paulo Carosa, Gordon Chang, and Ron Rischlack are all straight ahead. If you'd like to comment on tonight's show, send me a tweet. I'm at Raymond Arroyo. Let's get started. First up, my exclusive interview with the vice president. We joined Mike Pence on Air Force Two for a rally to Columbus, Ohio on Monday. Our journey began at Joint Base Andrews in Washington, landing shortly thereafter at John Glenn International Airport in Columbus. We attended the Trump-Pence rally at Savco & Sons, a family-owned construction company. After the rally, I sat down with Vice President Pence for a wide-ranging conversation where we spoke about the Amy Coney Barrett hearings, religious freedom, health care, the presidential campaign, and more. Here's my exclusive interview with Vice President Mike Pence. Mr. Vice President, thank you for inviting us along on this journey today with you here to Columbus. You bet. Good to have you along. Uh, delighted. At the debate, you raised a concern. You were worried that Kamala Harris, Joe Biden, and the Democrats would use Amy Coney Barrett's hearing to throw charges that she might be a religious extremist, use her pro-life leanings against her. Do you still have those concerns now that this hearing's underway? Well, I think we are concerned because when you look at the pattern of the last hearings that Judge Amy Coney Barrett went through two years ago, um, you had the, the Democrat uh, ranking member of the committee uh, say that uh, because of her Catholic faith that, that, that Judge Barrett's the dogma lived loudly within her. You, you had uh, Senator Durbin from Illinois uh, express concern over whether she was an Orthodox a Catholic. Mm. And, and Kamala Harris actually criticized one of our previous nominations to a federal court in Nebraska because he was a member of the Catholic Knights of Columbus that takes a, a, a pro-life, pro-marriage view. And I, I must tell you that, that, that the American people know that the the freedom to live, to work, to worship is enshrined in the Constitution of the United States of America. There's no, no religious test for public office. Uh, and, uh, and, and our hope is that in the hearing in the coming days that we won't see the kind of intolerance for Judge Amy Coney Barrett's Catholic faith that we saw in her hearing and in prior hearings. It's very likely they will raise that letter she signed several years ago, a local right to life uh, organization, St. Joseph County in Indiana. Um, she signed this letter suggesting that Roe v. Wade was poorly reasoned. Your thoughts on how that might hurt her in the hearings, or should that be left aside since she's a constructionalist? Well. First, let me say, like our president, I'm pro-life and I don't apologize for it. Mm -hmm. I couldn't be more proud to be part of the most pro-life administration in American history. But President Trump nominated Judge Amy Coney Barrett because she is a brilliant jurist who will uphold the Constitution, who will interpret laws as written and won't legislate from the bench. I, I wouldn't presume how she would rule uh, on any case. Uh, but, but the president kept his word in nominating someone who will uphold 
all the liberties enshrined in our Constitution and, and will serve uh, in a manner consistent with her, her mentor with whom she worked, the late Justice Antonin Scalia. What do you make of the fact that it looks like the Democrats and the judiciary have decided to turn the hearing into a commercial for Obamacare, holding up all the people who've been affected by it? Is that a concession that Amy Coney Barrett is all but a justice at this point? Well, first, uh, let me say we rightly paused uh, to mourn the passing of the late Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg. Mm -hmm. um, she, uh, she had a lifetime of service and greatly advanced uh, the interest of women, both in the law and in our society uh, at large. But right after that, President Trump fulfilled his constitutional duty. Mm -hmm. The Constitution says the president shall appoint judges to the Supreme Court. And in 29 times, from George Washington to Barack Obama, where there was a vacancy during a presidential election year, the president nominated. And, and the president nominated Judge Amy Coney Barrett, as was his duty and obligation. Mm -hmm. Now the Senate is going through their constitutional duty uh, to advise and consent, uh, and they're reviewing her qualifications. But we, uh, we fully expect, based upon the opening day's hearing, that they're going to take the opportunity to make a case for Obamacare. But I must tell you, Ray, I, Obamacare was a disaster. The American people remember all the empty promises of Obamacare. If you like your doctor, you can keep them. If you like your health insurance, you can keep it. Uh, premiums would go down. All of those things were false. Mm -hmm. In fact, when we came into office, Obamacare premiums had more than doubled. And the president took decisive action early on to end the individual mandate that actually right. required Americans to pay for Obamacare, whether they got any insurance or not. Mm -hmm. But all along the way, we've made it very clear. We're going to repeal and replace Obamacare with the kind of health care that lowers the cost of insurance without growing the size of government. We're going to protect pre-existing conditions. And Democrats are looking to an upcoming case before the Supreme Court. They're presuming how a Justice mm -hmm. Amy Coney Barrett would rule. But the American people can be confident. With four more years of President Donald Trump in the White House, We'll have health care reform based on freedom, free markets. We'll, we'll allow Americans to purchase health insurance across state lines. We'll protect Americans with pre-existing conditions. The other thing they can why, count why on too, Ray, is that, yeah. that, that, uh, that uh, if Joe Biden was elected president of the United States and the Democrats somehow took control of the Senate, mm. the reality is that his plan for Obamacare, including a public option, would lead us inexorably towards socialized medicine. Bernie Sanders boasted not long ago that he would be the one writing health care reform uh, in, in an administration of Biden won. So this, this, yeah. these are very real issues before the American people. The American people know President Trump and I will protect pre-existing conditions and we will give them the kind of health care reform that they deserve uh, and will we'll repeal the disastrous policies of Obamacare. While we're, we're talking about health care, I have to ask you about the ways in which religious liberty are being conscripted and attacked via other, other rights that have now entered into the body politic, but even health care. Um, you all supported the Little Sisters of the Poor. Joe Biden has said he will take the Little Sisters to court to make sure they pay that Obama mandate, which is essentially to provide abortifacients and contraceptives for their employees. What else is at stake here? What will you do to ensure that this doesn't continue to happen for religious groups and mission-led groups like the Little Sisters? I think Americans who cherish faith should be very concerned at the prospect of a, of a Biden-Harris administration. Because when Joe Biden was vice president, we saw a steady assault on the religious liberty of the American people. I mean, to think that the Little Sisters of the Poor, the extraordinary women that have taken a vow of poverty to help those most in need among us would be hauled into the federal court in the last administration, forced to compromise their faith, was just unconscionable. And President Trump, early in our administration, ended the assault on the Little Sisters of the Poor. And then, fortunately, the Supreme Court voted by seven to two to make that permanent. But that's why it's, 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 it's all the more outrageous that Joe Biden has actually said that he intends 
to haul the little sisters of the poor back into court to force them to compromise their face under the strictures of Obamacare. But it's not an isolated incident. In, the, in one instance after another in the last administration, we saw, we saw an assault on the freedom of religion. It's, it's one of the reasons the president and I have stood so strong throughout this administration to protect the religious freedom of every American of every faith. And with four more years mm -hmm. of President Donald Trump in the White House, we will appoint men and women to our courts who will respect our First Amendment freedom of religion. And we will continue to advance policies that protect the conscience rights of doctors and nurses and all of those who serve the most needy among us. Speaking of the courts, Joe Biden, there is a question of whether he will pack the courts. He's been asked this right. repeatedly. Well, now, are you pack the make court? sure you, in fact, let people know he doesn't you're want to a senator. The question. I'm not going to answer the question. What? You tried to get Kamala Harris to answer the question at the last debate. So I think the American people would really like to know if Judge Amy Coney Barrett is confirmed to the Supreme Court of the United States, are you and Joe Biden, if somehow you win this election, going to pack the Supreme Court to get your way? She would not. Joe Biden this weekend said, the voters don't deserve to know. Well, sir, don't the voters deserve to know no, where they he's don't. In fact, he says you and President Trump are trying to pack the courts. Your response. When you're running for the highest office in the land, the American people deserve to know whether you're going to respect the highest court in the land. And the fact that Joe Biden and Kamala Harris consistently refuse to say whether they will yield to the most radical elements in their party, add seats to the Supreme Court, that's been nine justices for 150 years, is outrageous and it's unacceptable. Mm -hmm. In the presidential debate, Joe Biden refused to answer the question. In the vice presidential debate, Kamala Harris, again, used the same line that the election is underway. But most remarkably to me is that when Joe Biden was asked on the campaign trail last Friday if the American people deserve an answer, he said, no, they don't deserve it. But as I could tell here in Ohio today, the American people, no different. Uh, they deserve a straight answer. It's time for Joe Biden and Kamala Harris to come clean on court packing. And, and Ray, the only explanation to their refusal to answer the question is that, that if Joe Biden and Kamala Harris are elected, to the White House if they, if they gain a majority in the Senate and hold the House. They're going to add seats to the Supreme Court. They're going to, they're going to take the approach that they couldn't win by the rules mm -hmm. in the Supreme Court. So they're going to change the rules uh, and, and add seats to the court you know and what add, add liberal activists to the court to obviate how the American people voted in the election. So look, the President and I are going to continue to take this case to the American people. And in President Donald Trump, the American people can be confident uh, that we will have four more years of principled conservatives appointed to our courts, and we will respect a nine-seat Supreme Court and the independent judiciary of the United States. Uh, we talked about the debate in passing. Did you imagine, ever imagine, that this debate, that a fly, would <laughs> become the media narrative? What did you think when you saw that starting to happen? <laughs> I didn't pay much attention to it. You know, it really was a privilege for me to be on that stage. Um, uh, my wife was uh, right in my line of sight. Mm. My kids were there. And to be able really to tell the story of what this president has done mm -hmm. for the American people. I mean, in our first three years, President Donald Trump literally kept every promise he made to the American people. We rebuild our military, which means even more to me, having a, a son in the Marine and a son-in-law in the Navy. We revived our economy by cutting taxes for working families and businesses. We rolled back a record level of regulations. We unleashed American energy. Mm -hmm. We fought for free and fair trade. Saw more than seven million jobs created in our first three years. And wages were rising at the fastest pace mm -hmm. in more than a decade, especially for blue collar, hardworking Americans. And this president stood for the right to life. He stood for religious liberty. We appointed more than 230 conservatives to our federal courts and all along the way he stood for law and order and with the men and women of law enforcement even while we were advancing the interest of African Americans and our minorities like no other administration in my lifetime. In our first three years we saw the lowest unemployment ever recorded for African Americans. President Trump made funding for historically black colleges and universities mm. permanent. We stood strong for school choice so important to so many underprivileged minority families in our cities. And it was this president that passed criminal justice reform. 
uh, to make our, our justice system more fair and more equitable, especially to our minorities. And so all along the way, we've, we've delivered on the promises that we made. And for me to be able to be on that stage, to tell that story, as well as the president's strong, consistent leadership through the challenging mm -hmm. days of this coronavirus pandemic was a great honor. One more question I have to ask you about COVID. We are Please. hearing it even at Amy Coney Barrett's hearings. They are claiming, the Democrats, that you and the Trump administration withheld information from the American people and are encouraging super spreader-like events and they're calling out the rallies you're holding across the country. Are you putting even your supporters at risk by having rallies like this? The American people have a constitutional right to peaceably assemble. And we're very confident. As Americans have shown throughout the last eight months, uh, the people of this country know how to put their own health, their family's health, and the health of the people in their community first. Uh, we're having uh, events outdoors, and we'll continue to take proper measures. But, but Ray, I, I think the stakes in this election have never been higher. The choice has never been clear. I, I actually think this election may be one of the most important elections in the life of this nation. In every real sense, when, when you look at this president's agenda, based on freedom and our highest ideals and values, versus Joe Biden and the radical left and an agenda that would take our nation uh, in a completely different direction than we've ever gone before, chart a completely different future uh, for our children. Uh, we're going to continue to take our case all across mm -hmm. this country. We're going to trust the American people with their health. Mm -hmm. We're going to trust them with the future of this country. And I just know that American people are going to choose freedom. And they're going to choose four more years of President Donald Trump in the White House. Today I heard you turn Dianne Feinstein's words on her. And the ranking Democrat on the Judiciary Committee said Judge Barrett's Catholic faith was of concern and said, quote, the dogma lives loudly within you. Well, I got news for the Democrats and their friends in Hollywood. That dogma lives loudly in me. That dogma lives loudly in you. What does that mean to you personally? Why did you say that? You know, I've often said I'm a Christian, a conservative, and a Republican in that order. Mm -hmm. And um, when I hear the kind of religious intolerance that we've heard coming from Democrat leaders in recent years, um, like millions of Americans, I take it very personally. I mean, the American people cherish our first freedom, the freedom of religion. And, and for me, the ability to, to live and to, to work and to raise my family in a manner consistent with my faith is at the very heart of who I am. And I think you could tell at the rally today that when I said that dogma lives loudly in me, I also said to the crowd, that dogma lives loudly in you, and you could tell that it does. Look, President Trump often says, this is a nation of faith. Mm -hmm. As I travel around America, the sweetest words I ever hear, when people will stop, take a moment and say, I'm praying for you. Mm -hmm. And the president and I hear it all the time. Yeah. And I was, I was moved to hear Judge Amy Coney Barrett close her opening statement today by saying that she believes in prayer. And this nation believes in prayer and we cherish the freedom, the freedom to, to live out our faith every day. And, um, under President Donald Trump, we're going to protect that freedom for four more years. Mr. Vice President, thank you for the time. Thank you. Great to be back on EWTN. Our thanks to the Vice President and his staff for their assistance. This week's Supreme Court nominee Amy Coney Barrett sat for days of questioning by the Judiciary Committee. This is some of what she faced. Now, Justice Ginsburg did not tell the committee how she would vote in any particular case but she did freely discuss how she viewed a woman's right to choose. But Judge Barrett, your record clearly shows you hold a different view. Healthcare is on the line, uh, and Judge, uh, that's what's on the line in your nomination hearing. Do you agree with Justice Scalia's view that Roe was wrongly decided? President Trump has told America he would end the ACA. He promised explicitly that he would only nominate judges that would do the right thing and eliminate the Affordable Care Act. You would be the polar opposite of Justice Ginsburg.
So that was a brief glimpse of the Senate confirmation hearings of Supreme Court nominee Amy Coney Barrett. For analysis of the hearing, we're joined by professor of law and a colleague of Amy Coney Barrett's at Notre Dame, Paolo Caroso. Thank you so much for joining us. Um, I want to begin with the Democrats spending so much of this hearing, uh, Paolo, using Barrett's personal views to argue she would vote to overturn Roe. What do you make of this line of attack? Listen. You said that Brown is, and I know my time is running out, is a super precedent. That's something uh, the Supreme Court has not even said, but you have said that. So if you say that, why won't you say that about Roe v. Wade? Roe is not a super precedent because calls for its overruling have never ceased, but that doesn't mean that Roe should be overruled. It just means that it doesn't fall on the small handful of cases like Marbury versus Madison and Brown versus the board that no one questions anymore. Did they score any points on the Roe v. Wade front, Paula? No, I really don't think so. I uh, The way that I heard the exchanges going, my reading of it was that they were grasping at the personal views that she had precisely because they had nothing else to go on with respect to her views of the law, which were uh, sound and described with great accuracy what her interpretive methods would be. And so they're trying to, in, in essence, uh, to call into question her sincerity and the truthfulness uh, that uh, with which she says that she won't impose her personal or political or policy views on the law as she's interpreting and applying it. Yeah, I, I think we were also all treated to what a lifetime of teaching law and educating people who perhaps misunderstand the nuance and complexity of constitutional law, what it all means. And she had great, I thought, grace, skill, and um, uh, kindness, charity almost, in the way she schooled so many of these senators. Uh, a case on the Affordable Care Act will be heard a week after Election Day. Now, during her confirmation hearing, Judge Barrett was repeatedly asked about her position on Obamacare. Uh, several of the Democratic senators held up pictures of people who would be affected uh, should the Affordable Care Act be struck down. Was that appropriate and on point at a Supreme Court hearing, in your estimation? Well, no, in the sense that it really doesn't go in any way to her qualifications or the evaluation of mm -hmm. what she would bring to the bench. Um, and to my mind, it was implicitly an acknowledgement that they knew that she is qualified, uh, that she is, uh, in, in some senses, almost untouchable in her qualifications. We've heard from so many people, including the ABA today. And so I think her opponents were choosing to use the occasion more to score political points that they thought would be advantageous for them in the elections coming up in November. Yeah, as I mentioned with uh, Vice President Pence earlier in the week, uh, it, it seems a concession that they they knew that this uh, this appointment of Amy Coney Barrett was a fait accompli. They really could do little to obstruct it, so they decided to turn this into a commercial for Obamacare and and you know try to use it as campaign moments there. Uh, at one point during questioning on Tuesday, however, Senator Chris Coons asked Judge Barrett if she would commit to recusing herself from any case arising from the election results. She had this to say. I haven't even written anything that I would think anybody could reasonably say, oh, this is how she might resolve an election dispute. And I would consider it, let's see, I certainly hope that all members of the committee have more confidence in my integrity than to think that I would allow myself to be used as a pawn to decide this election for the American people. Uh, Paolo, what do you make of Judge Barrett being asked to recuse herself from an election case should that case come before the court? Well, as her, as her answer illustrated, uh, and, and I've known Amy for 24 years, ever since she was a student, um, so uh, I, I can confirm that you know, what she said is absolutely right. She will be beholden to no one. And so to ask her to recuse herself simply because she was nominated by someone uh, is presuming that she's there to do the will of someone else other than the responsible job of a judge, which is what she is going to be doing.
Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I have to say, I didn't like the idea that both on the right and left, they attempted to paint her into a corner and say, well, this is a conservative woman. She'll be a conservative judge uh, or she'll be, you know, uh, she, she's, she's the opposite of Ruth Bader Ginsburg. If you're a good jurist, if you're following judicial precedent, this politicizing, did that offend you at all as someone who teaches law? Well, it does disappoint me to see that uh, it's become so pervasive on all sides of our mm -hmm. political spectrum to regard judges yeah. as policymakers, as ones who are there right. just to do what they think is the right thing. And everything that mm -hmm. we try to teach our students is, in fact, oriented towards the idea that the rule of law does stand apart and that it serves the common good precisely by applying the law as it was written by the democratic policymakers and that it's not the roles of judges to try to 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 make the laws better or more just or more or more uh, conducive to you know the goals and ends that they would like to see mhm mm no that that seems to me the, the the proper approach i hope our i hope our politicians get the memo uh, senator Macy Hirono of Hawaii attempted to paint judge barrett as anti lgbt take a listen to this not once but twice you use the term sexual preference to describe those in the LGBTQ community. And let me make clear, sexual preference is an offensive and outdated term. Uh, what did you make of this? What did you make of that line of questioning? I mean, uh, I, I, many Democratic members, including some of the people on that committee, have used uh, the term sexual preference. Uh, they have, and it's been used even by uh, Justice Ruth Gader Bader Ginsburg herself. Um, it's, uh, of course, language changes, and we understand that uh, the, the nuances of words change, and we try to adapt appropriately. Um, so the language around sexual orientation and preference has changed as well, and we try to adapt. But to hold mm -hmm. someone uh, up and say that her views are somehow fundamentally contrary to the basic rights of part of our citizens mm -hmm. A community because uh, it doesn't concord exactly with the way that someone would like the word to be used today is just preposterous. Uh, and, mm -hmm. you know, more to the point is that everything in Amy Coney Barrett's, Barrett's record and person and the life that she's lived suggests that she's a woman of incredible integrity and decency with regard to everyone who comes before her, regardless of their views, regardless of the differences. She treats people with charity and generosity and hospitality. And, uh, and, and everyone, even those who disagree with her, have always acknowledged that. Two years ago, when Amy Barrett was in front of this committee, the Democrats went after her for being a practicing Catholic. This time, Democrats did try to bring up an anti-abortion letter that she signed 15 years ago as a sort of back way to go after her faith. Judge Barrett responded, and Republican Senator Josh Hawley made clear the Democrats should not try to go after her faith again. Listen. I feel like I should emphasize here, as I emphasize to others asking me the question, that I do see as distinct my personal, moral, religious views and my task of applying the law as a judge. I'm not aware of, of any law or provision of the Constitution that says that uh, if you are a member of the Catholic Church and adhere to the teachings of the Catholic Church or you have religious convictions in line with those of your church teaching that you're therefore barred from office. Are you aware of any constitutional provision to that effect? I would think that the religious test clause would make it unconstitutional. Professor, for the most part, there was surprisingly little talk of Judge Barrett's Catholic faith. Was that a reaction, you think, to the blowback they got during the first round? Oh, I definitely think it, it must be. Um, but it is encouraging that it was the case. In other words, that uh, there was so much negative reaction to the questioning of her faith and who she is as a person and whether it's possible for a person of strong faith to be a responsible judge uh, the last time around, that they knew that it would be unwise to go back there again. So that was actually one of the points about these hearings that I found encouraging, is that, uh, mm -hmm. that, that, they, that they kept that out of the discussion, really. Amy Barrett was repeatedly asked if she shared Justice Scalia's jurisprudence. Obviously, uh, he was a mentor to her. On Wednesday, she was asked again. She put it this way. And I hope that you aren't suggesting that I don't have my own mind or that I, I couldn't think independently or that I would just 
decide, like, oh, let me see what Justice Scalia has said about this in the past, because I assure you I have my own mind, so I share his philosophy, but I have never said that I would always reach the same outcome as he did. Uh, professor, speak to that answer. You've known Amy Coney Barrett for 24 years. Uh, uh, that gives us a, a, a bit of insight into the way she approaches the law as a judge. It, it certainly does. Uh, first of all, uh, to say that she has her own mind is uh, a, a radical understatement. She is uh, mm -hmm. clearly a, a mind that is scintillating in its capacities and thinks deeply and carefully about everything that's in front of her. And uh, her debt to Justice Scalia is a debt regarding the methods by which she approaches the law. And, and that's she's made clear. So the originalist and textualist emphases that he had is what she tries to follow, too. But any mm -hmm. exercise in adjudication, you know, we know is an exercise in judgment and prudence and reason. And so no two people, even following the same methods, are always going to agree on everything. We've seen right. that with the justices that are currently on the court. Uh, some, some of whom disagreed with Justice Scalia, even sharing the, the basic methods uh, by which they approach their materials. And so the same absolutely would be true of Ju Judge Barrett as well. Uh, you know, Professor, uh, her friends in New Orleans, Amy Coney Barrett's friends whom I interviewed a few weeks ago, they said even as a young girl, she would find out they had a paper due the night before it was due. She'd dash it off. The other girls had been working on it for weeks. Her paper would get an A. She'd be at the top of the class, and they were somewhere behind. Uh, that mind is still working, and I, I have to say, watching her handle these questions, uh, it's clear her, her brilliance is really clear. And I love the moment when, when John Cornyn, you know, talked to her, what do you have written on the paper? And she held up that, that blank notebook pad. What did that give us an insight to? What did you see as her colleague for, and, and as a student and later as a colleague uh, over these last 24 years? What didn't we see at that hearing? Well, I think we did get a pretty good picture uh, of her, but um, so much of it was focused uh, either on the, the legal questions and the jurisprudential questions or on, to the extent it went to her his character and personal beliefs, they were really relatively hostile and tried to, I think, stereotype her into certain mm -hmm. narrow categories. And so what we didn't see, I think, is um, the sort of magnanimity of spirit that she has with regard to other people. And I think that's important to how she will serve on the Supreme Court after she's confirmed. She will be someone mm -hmm. who listens, who builds bridges, who respects her colleagues, who treats them with charity and respect. And I think that will make a difference in how effective of a judge she is. Yeah. And, Professor, all of her friends tell me here that w what fun she is, you know, and, and how she maintains close contact with friends over many years. My brother even did a play with her in high school, which I have a personal story about I won't share now. But before I let you go, uh, a letter was written and signed by a group of current and emeritus faculty members of Notre Dame asking Amy Coney Barrett to issue a public statement calling for a halt to her nomination process until after the November presidential election. What do you make of this letter? And are these people really her colleagues? Well, I think it's much more telling that there have been uh, many letters written, including one uh, by a, a large number of the tenured faculty at the law school, as well as individual letters. I wrote one. Many others have written them mm -hmm. uh, in support of her. And, uh, and the ones in support are the ones who actually know her. Uh, it is telling that the mm -hmm. ones who signed the letter asking her to withdraw, I can't point to a single person on that who knows her well or who has ever worked with her in any capacity. But even mm -hmm. more to the substance of the letter, I think the fundamental mistake is that it presumes that her appointment will be tainted by virtue of the person appointing her. And so by, mm -hmm. by virtue of their objections to President Trump and to the way in which uh, procedurally this is being handled, they think that somehow that will make her, her appointment um, somehow something to call into question, not worthy. Mm -hmm. And I, again, I just, I think that misunderstands uh, what judges will do uh, generally, and it m misunderstands terribly what kind of a person Amy Barrett is and what kind of integrity she's going to bring to that position. Mm -hmm. We will leave it there. Notre Dame Professor Paolo Caroso, thank you so much for being with us and, and for giving us so much time. It was a great pleasure. Thank you.
And the day has finally come. My first picture book, The Spider Who Saved Christmas, is out this week. I've been amazed by the early readers who tell me the book has instigated fascinating conversations with their children about Christmas and the people at the center of the story we thought we knew, people often confined to Fontanini figures or ornaments. The illustrations are cinematic and dramatic. It will warm your Advent season, and it makes a wonderful gift. This week, the Register, in a review, wrote, As good legends often do, the spider who saved Christmas tells a historical truth, the flight into Egypt, but delightfully adds so much more. Arroyo's text and the illustrations of artist Randy Galagos work in tandem to present the story as if it were a movie, moving dynamically but subtly from frame to frame Galagos's work is dazzling in its brightness and contrasts. The spider who saved Christmas will find a cherished home in the hearts of both parents and children alike. It's a very special book. It revives an all-but-forgotten legend surrounding the Christmas story. It also explains why we decorate our trees with tinsel each Christmas. The Spider Who Saved Christmas. It's available now at EWTN's religious catalog, Amazon, or you can visit discoverlegends.com for more information. And by the way, it is already in its second printing. I just got notice of it a few moments ago. So get out there and buy your copy. In the midst of the presidential campaign, Communist China has warned the United States against its plan to sell arms to Taiwan. The warning follows China's recent military exercises simulating a takeover of the independent island nation. Given all the noise in the lead up to the presidential election, what are we missing when it comes to U.S.-China relations and human rights? Here with analysis of all of this and more, I'm joined by Asian affairs expert Gordon Chang. Gordon, thanks for being here. Beijing has been really making a show of hostility toward Taiwan. Last week, China released footage of what they call real combat. Uh, it conducted last month in Taiwanese airspace. A Chinese invasion would present the greatest threat to global peace in a generation. What are the Chinese doing? Why are they doing this now? And do you think they can get away with it? Yeah, right now, I think China is realizing that, for instance, its uh, incursions into India are not paying off. And so I think that they mm -hmm. decided that they're going to shift their focus elsewhere, which is Taiwan. And that's why I'm concerned, because I think Xi Jinping, the Chinese ruler, is lashing out. Now, a lot of what China is saying is bluster. But nonetheless, as uh, James Lilly, the former U.S. ambassador to Beijing, said, China always telegraphs its punches. And that's what it's doing right now. So we need to deter China. Mm. China's warned it would take new measures in response to this planned U.S. arms sale to Taiwan. What measures could they take against the U.S.? Well, they could do a number of things. Um, you know, we have robust economic relations with China. So they could, for instance, go after U.S. companies uh, on Chinese soil, mm -hmm. or they could do something which would take us completely by surprise. So, for instance, some of Taiwan's islands are just one or two miles off of China's coast, and they could seize one of those islands. Um, so there's, there's mm. a whole range of, of options. And that actually would be something that probably Xi Jinping would say, well, now I've got a victory because I've reclaimed part of Taiwan. So there are um, things that he could do, which, you know, we're not contemplating right now. Wow. How far do you think the U.S. would go to protect Taiwan? I don't know, especially during an election season. Um, and, mm -hmm. you know, we have um, all sorts of statements that candidates have been making. But I do think that it is in the U.S. interest to defend Taiwan, because for more than a century, we have drawn our Western defense perimeter off the coast of East Asia, and Taiwan is smack dab in the middle of that. It prevents the mm -hmm. Chinese Navy and the Chinese Air Force from surging into the Western Pacific. So it's in our interest to maintain it. But, Raymond, there's one more reason, and that is China's attacking democracy around the world. We cannot allow Beijing to absorb any democracy, especially one as important as Taiwan. Mm. Well, what would happen, do you think, if Biden were to win the presidency? I'd be very concerned. And the reason is um, China usually challenges a new American president by doing something especially provocative. Um, they did that with President Bush. Um, uh, they did that with President Obama. They have left President Trump alone because I think they're afraid of him. But nonetheless, um, I think that they would go after Biden to see how he would react. 
So that's the danger that China will see, you know, that they'll create a crisis to see how um, the president reacts. Mm. The Chinese government is also eyeing other territories surrounding China, such as a slice of Taj uh, Tajikistan, uh, Okinawa, the uh, Japanese islands. How do you see this playing out? This is really dangerous because China's territorial ambitions have been expanding. You know, they make the a hegemon. formal claim to about 85 percent of the South China Sea, and they've got a formal claim now to the Senkakus in the East China Sea. Um, but as you point out, um, they're thinking of a number of different areas where we didn't think that they would make a sovereignty claim, including the ones that you mm -hmm. mentioned. So right now, Xi Jinping's ambitions are expanding rapidly. And that's a very bad sign for not only the countries surrounding China, not only for the United States, but also for the world. This week, Secretary Pompeo issued a press release on the U.N. Human Rights Council's embrace of authoritarian regimes and criticized the U.N. General Assembly for once again electing countries with aberrant human rights records, including China, Russia, Cuba, uh, to the Human Rights Council. Chinese state media tweeted this response. We are all humans. The combined population of China and developing countries far exceeds that of the West. If the definition of human rights has to be monopolized by the West, this is contamination of human rights in essence. The Human Rights Council is not backyard of the West. What do you make of that Chinese response? What they're trying to do is to change the notion of human rights. So, for instance, Beijing is involved in the mass internment of minorities. There's genocide, slavery, institutionalized mm. rape, other atrocities. And China is trying to normalize that behavior. So it's very important for us to say this is not Western. This is not American. This is indeed just human. And, and we've got to make that case, even though we're not on the Human Rights Council. And I can understand why, mm -hmm. because we do not want to legitimize that group at this particular time. Um, but we cannot allow them to change the notion of decency and fairness. And um, it, it's just absolutely critical that we defend uh, the notion of human rights. And North Korea just had another ballistic missile display on Saturday, while its leader, uh, Kim Jong-un, was seen crying and apologizing to his people on the same day for not creating a better economy. On Wednesday, Secretary of State Mike Pompeo was asked about how concerned he was given this missile launch. Listen. Well, yes, absolutely. It's important to know that when uh, a nation builds out its missile program, the most important thing they do to make sure that it's actually functional is to test those missiles. You should know that the Chinese Communist Party conducted more missile tests last year than the rest of the world combined. So the agreement, the understandings, albeit not achieving our ultimate objective in North Korea, has certainly led to reduced risk from the United States vis where we would have been had we continued on the path that the previous administration had engaged in. What do you make of Secretary Pompeo's response, Gordon? And what is North Korea up to? Well, North Korea has been fast developing its, both its nuclear weapons and its ballistic missiles. What we saw uh, on Saturday, which was the 75th anniversary of the founding of the Korean Workers' Party, was really worrisome because that missile, mm -hmm. which has been dubbed the Wasong-16, actually can reach mm -hmm. all parts of the United States with a bigger payload than the one they tested in November 2017, which itself could mm -hmm. reach Key West. Um, so, you know, right now there is no place that is safe in the U.S. And what the North Koreans are doing right now is uh, developing launchers with more uh, with uh, ability to carry bigger and bigger payloads and to carry decoys. So um, they can hold us at ransom. Hmm. Going back to China, the, the Vatican China deal will be renewed this month. What do you believe, Gordon, is driving the Vatican here? They are uh, rhapsodic about renewing this deal. Uh, we have the Secretary of State, uh, Cardinal Parolin, saying we, we, we've got to do this. This is in the best interest. We're in dialogue. And, and, and this is a good thing. Well, it's not a good thing because the original agreement, which was signed in September 2018, China violated it from almost the very moment that the ink was dry. Um, and I think what we're going to see in China is that Catholics are probably going to de um, desert the official Catholic Church, which is run by Beijing, and probably move to unofficial house congregations. 
um, where they pray on their own. This is what Protestants have done, and I think we'll see the Catholics do the same thing. Yeah, no, the, the, the sad thing is that underground church that has existed low these many years, uh, they've been exposed now. And the, 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 the underground church, because of this action from Rome, a lot of these people are being tracked, they're being rounded up, even the scripture itself is being deformed. So I, I just don't see how this, this is a, a good thing or a, a, a move forward for faith of any people, but certainly those in, in you know, the dire straits that they find themselves in in China. Raymond, I couldn't agree with you more. Um, this is a setback for Christianity in China, certainly a setback for Catholicism. Um, China has made it clear that it is the enemy of faith, and I don't believe that there is a possibility for the church to um, compromise with uh, China. So I think Pope Francis is, is absolutely wrong on this, and I think history will judge that this was a mistake of, of great proportions. Yeah. We shall leave it there. Gordon Chang, thank you so much. You can visit Gordon at gordonchang.com for the latest insights, his articles on China, North Korea, and much more. Thank you. Thanks, Raymond. Ron Rischlack is up next. But first, a Roman Catholic bishop has rebuked Democratic candidate for President Joe Biden for his stance on abortion. Bishop Rick Stika of Knoxville, Tennessee, is urging Biden to rethink his support for abortion, citing the inevitability of God's judgment. In a tweet on Sunday, Bishop Stika wrote, at your judgment before God, how will you explain changing your position about abortion? And how will you explain promoting no limits and allowing all protections removed, protecting the most innocent. Earlier this year, Stika also singled out Biden's running mate, Senator Kamala Harris, an as, quote, an anti-Catholic bigot, an end quote. Joe Biden has faced public criticism from other Catholic leaders, including Providence Bishop Thomas Tobin, and has even been denied communion for his public support for abortion. And for the first time in history, a clergy sex abuse trial has convened in the Vatican's criminal court. The case concerns abuse allegations that occurred at the St. Pius X Youth Seminary inside the walls of the Vatican, just steps from the papal residence. A priest at the seminary is accused of molesting an altar boy multiple times between 2007 and 2012. The rector of the seminary is also being charged for participating in a cover-up. Neither of the accused has responded publicly to the charges. The next hearing is scheduled for October 27th, and we will be continuing to cover this story. On March 2nd of this year, the Vatican opened its apostolic archive covering the papacy of Pope Pius XII, allowing researchers in. The wartime pope has been criticized by some for decades due to his alleged failure to speak out against the Holocaust. The Vatican's secret archive closed after only one week due to the COVID-19. Now, after viewing some of the vast trove of records, a few scholars claim to have discovered proof that the Vatican under Pius XII was guilty of anti-Semitism and complicity in the Holocaust. Is that true? To react as one of the world's foremost experts on the actions of Pius XII during the war, He's an author of the book, Hitler, the War, and the Pope. Please welcome back to the program, distinguished professor of law at the University of Mississippi, Ron Rischlack. Ron, thanks for being with us. Uh, for decades, the Vatican and scholars like you have been answering charges that Pius XII did nothing or was complicit in the Holocaust. But that was not always the story. For years after the war, the Pope was praised. What changed that narrative and when very quickly? Well, what really happened was in the late 1950s and early the 1960s, an operation directed from the Kremlin, a disinformation campaign set out to discredit not just Pope Pius XII, but really the Catholic Church religion itself by associating a pope with the Nazis. Hmm. So let's fast forward to March 2nd of 2020. Uh, the Pius XII records are made available to scholars before COVID shut it down. A few scholars were able to sift through at least some of the documents. Uh, one of them, a father, Hubert Wolf, a German professor of church history, announced he had a smoking gun proving Pius was an anti-Semite. Now, Ron, explain what he found, and does it really prove what he claims? 
It absolutely does not prove what he claimed. It was what he claims. It was an internal memo uh, in 1942. The Americans asked the Vatican. They said, "We've heard these horrible things," and they went through a litany of things and said, "Can you confirm these these matters?" There was an internal memo to the Pope that said some of these may be true, but we no, we can't confirm everything, and we know they're exaggerations. Even among Jewish people, they might be exaggerating. Um, the Pope re reported back. To, to the United States, no, we can't confirm this. However, he then joined uh, and made, made a very profound statement in uh, in December of 1942 about how Jews and, and people were being exterminated because of their descent or their race. Uh, and uh, he, he was actually correct. And he, he made the right decision. He did not take this advice. I don't know how you take an intro memo and say that, that it was... Uh, we don't follow the memo, and you say that that shows anti-Semitism of some type. Is there anything found by Father Wolf that is cause for alarm about the intentions or true heart of Pius XII or even his staff at the time? No, of his staff, you can say there were people who were very profoundly trying to figure out what was taking place. And uh, there was some doubt about whether all the accounts were true. And the account from the United States was not entirely correct. And so, no, I don't mm -hmm. believe you can draw any such conclusion for it. We knew this was going to happen, but it's, it's preposterous how quickly it happened. Also, in, in that week that the archives were opened, a longtime papal critic, uh, author David Kurzer, claimed in a piece in The Atlantic that he and his researchers found documents proving that the Vatican engaged in what he calls the kidnapping of two Jewish children whose parents were killed in the Holocaust. Those two uh, orphan Jewish boys were adopted by a Catholic woman and later baptized. Uh, now, Ron, this is not a news story. You've written about this in the past. What new information, if any, did Kurtzer find? And is there anything to this assertion? Well, once again, what was found was an internal memoranda written to the Pope there's this discussion because the boys have been baptized, and that means the church has certain obligations. There was a lawsuit in France going through, making its way through the courts, took almost three years, uh, because the family wanted to get the children back. The lady who cared for them through these years wanted to adopt them. She'd had them baptized. So church leaders in France wrote to the Vatican and said, you know, what do we do in this circumstance? An internal memo says, well, you know, you got to consider what the church's obligations are. Now, the, when it comes to the pope, the pope ultimately says he approves the, the deal to, to send the children back to the, uh, to the family. In fact, the official church itself uh, cooperated and helped find the children to return them to the family. Somehow, because there was some debate internally about what was the appropriate matter, that becomes a basis for anti-Semitism. It's preposterous. It's, as uh, I wrote about for the Catholic League, I said, this would have been true had it been a Muslim, had it been an atheist, had it been anyone. The church is concerned mm -hmm. about people when they are baptized. Uh, they become Catholic then, and they have obligations. Mm -hmm. uh, but ultimately, when push came to shove, Pope Pius XII said, put the children back with their extended family. Ron, before the archives were briefly opened in March, Vatican archivists told reporters that the process of studying and analyzing and publishing findings should be long and slow and done with patience and care. Uh, Johan Ix, the director of the historical archive of the section for relations with states, uh, has a book out now in Italian and French, I guess it'll be in English soon, that you say verifies that Pius XII's actions during the war were honorable. Tell us about that, and how does he come to that conclusion? Well, Johan is a good friend of mine, and having been the archivist you know, in the Vatican, in these archives for years, he's got an enormous head start on everybody else. He was able to look at mm -hmm. documents that none of the rest of us could see, but he couldn't publish until the archives were open. And that's what he ah. has done. And we see all sorts of efforts of rescue, of, of, of putting people together after the war, during the war, finding missing people, things that were unknown, but he knew about, and they are now in the book. They confirm, as he's, by the way, he's told me for years, every, what, what, I've, what I've written will be confirmed when the archives are open. And his, his book says the same, it says the same. Um, and so it's funny, the critics who have year, for years said, you can't draw a judgment until all the documents are in, 
they find one rare document, an internal memoranda, and they say, you know, okay, we've got it now. We can now prove that Pius XII was an anti-Semite, which it does mm. no such thing. In fact, the Pope, in both of these circumstances, in essence, went away from the advice, and the advice was really laying out different possibilities. So it's it just right. it, it, trying to grab headlines, and, and you know, we kind of knew this was going to happen. This is very foreseeable. Mm -hmm. Ron, you yourself have made arrangements to study the archive. Uh, your plans were thwarted by COVID. What did you expect and hope to find, and when do you think the archive might reopen? Well, the archives have reopened now. They open, they, they open, then they close, then they open, then they close, and they're open now on a very limited basis. Uh, and so, I'm, you know, I'm beginning to look at when travel will become safe again, and when I go over there. And and when you you have to apply, you have to be credentialed to do this. And and I did that, and I had my credentials, and I would have gone in June, had not COVID shut everything down. Um, but I have some specific areas of investigation that I'd be lo I would be looking into. You'd have to sort of chart that out beforehand. And it may be driven by, by some things, you know, my next time, whenever I get to go, uh, by some findings that, that perhaps come out in the interim. Uh, but well, there, there's several very interesting, very topical issues. There's some documents that I've been told about that have not been released yet that I would love mm -hmm. to set my eyes upon. Uh, and I've, I've got to uh, I've got to make my, my way through Johan's book as well and see what all he's he's written about in his book. Well, Ron, get over there fast. Uh, there, there's this report that 10 percent of the Swiss Guard now have covid. They might shut the archive again on you. So get get up, book that flight quickly. And your book, Hitler, the War and the Pope, has been revised and expanded over the years. It's become required reading, really, for anyone who wants a full scope of the information on Pius XII and the pontificate. Uh, it's actually being sent free of charge to all Catholic schools and colleges in the U.S. How did that come about very quickly? The Zion Family Foundation from Alabama uh, put the funding together because we knew this was going to happen. We knew people would mm -hmm. find a document here or there and manufacture an argument. And we wanted to have a good resource available where people could go and look things up. And really, what's come up both times so far is really in my book already. I mean, there's, there's slight mm -hmm. uh, because there's an internal memo. I didn't specifically know that. But but the, the large issues have been there. And so when you hear about these things, the research is there to address them. And we're very happy and we're thankful for the foundation for doing that. Great. Hitler, the war and the Pope. The revised and expanded edition by Ron Rischlack is available at bookstores everywhere online and at the EWTN religious catalog. Thank you so much, Ron. We will be in touch. Thank you, Raymond. The World Over is now available as a podcast. You can download us at iTunes, Apple Podcasts, and Spotify. That's all the time we have for now. Be sure to catch us next week. Until then, we'll be scouting the world over for all that is seen and unseen. On behalf of the staff and crew of EWTN News, thanks for watching. I'm Raymond Arroyo. Bye now.